think that um, I did, as I said, I outlined um, some of the, the fantastic, I think, elements to, to the, the projects going forward. They've made uh, fantastic benefits to rural communities. Increased spend at a time of um, recession is obviously something that, that's um, very much to be welcomed. So I think that it's been very su successful over the last year, year and a half. And uh, Mr. Dominic Bradley is not in this place, so I'll call Mr. Sean Lynch. And Mr. Sean Lynch is not in this place. Oh, he is. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Sean Lynch for topical questions. He's available. Okay. Bermay, I'll get to pre blast can call you. Um, can I ask the Minister outline the potential for tourism on the Forest Estate? Um, yes, the Forest Service already delivers significant um, recreational and tourism benefits and the potential exists for further development, particularly through working with other rec um, recreational and tourism providers. Forest Service is continuing its work in development partnership arrangements with local authorities and other recreational providers to ensure that opportunities for progress are fully realised. This approach has led to the development of improved facilities in many areas, including um, the major mountain bike projects completed in Castlewell and Forest Park, Ross Trevor Park and Davo Forest in partnership with um, the local councils. We've seen multi-purpose trails network completed in Castle Ward, a regional play park opened in Sleeve Gullion, bio, um, biodiversity trails, um, trails launched in Learmount Forest in partnership with Derry Council. So there's been a whole suite of um, partnership um, working which has really been to the benefit um, in terms of tourism in our, in our force. And the Forest Service is also using funding from the Executive's Economy and Jobs Initiative to improve recreation and tourist facilities within Forest Service properties under the theme of supporting um, infrastructural investment. Mr Lynch for supplementary. Um, as in Fragrishian. As the Minister is aware, there's a, a tree disease, and does she believe that this will impact on this tourism potential? Girl, girl, my um, obviously, we'd want to limit any impact that tree disease will have on, on the potential of, of our forest. So, um, my department continues to put significant <coughs> resources into tackling um, this disease, particularly, um, I think the member's referring to P. Remorum. We've had follow-up inspections on sites identified through aerial, um, aerial surveillance in June and September and have confirmed an increased area of infected larch and as compared to 2012 and outbreaks in new geographic areas, notably westwards as far as um, County Fermanagh. So felling is underway at 12 force, um, including an area of 164 hectares and further action will be taken forward on a prioritised basis. We continue to engage with AFBI and research to help our understanding of the disease and we're working closely with plant health colleagues in the south and across in Britain. Since the disease was first um, diagnosed in Larch in 2010, over 900 hectares of Larch plantation have been failed to control the disease. So obviously these things do have an impact in terms of access to our forests, and we very much seek the cooperation of landowners and those people, general public, that visit our forests in terms of um, observing the biosecurity features and, and taking um, uh, I suppose precautions in, in, in washing wheels, for example, on bikes and prams when using our force. So we want to be able to limit the damage that disease can do um, to the tourism potential of our force. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Minister, last year uh, you will remember that my constituency of East Antrim had, uh, was affected by some of the worst of the winter conditions, uh, particularly the uh, snow. Um, and to that end, um, particularly rural um, and very isolated farms in the glens of Antrim suffered the most. Can the Minister tell us what lessons her departmental officials have learned and what uh, provision she has in place should we have similar conditions this year? Yes, and obviously the, the, the scenes that we witnessed last year were shocking. I mean, the extreme weather was um, something that hadn't been seen in, in quite a number of years. Um, I, I think that going into, um, we obviously on the back of that, we set up the fodder task force, which was looking at sort of prepared, preparedness for winter. And we're continuing to do that. And we've had a number of farmers actually that have taken part in our CAFRI courses around feed management. So that's, um, I suppose, in preparation for if this potentially um, occurred again. We worked with um, all the different stakeholders, so with the farming unions, with the banks, with the 
feed providers to make sure that um, we were put in place everything that could be put in place in the event of something like this happening again. The task force met on numerous occasions and they have agreed to meet again as and when required um, if, if, if we were to find ourselves in that position again. So I believe we're in a better state of preparedness. I um, believe that um, there were lessons obviously learned from all agencies because it was again it was a multi-agency re um, response to to that snow. So hopefully we don't find ourselves in that position again. But if we do, I believe that we're in a better state of preparedness. Your Dixon for a supplement, and I'd like to thank the minister for her her assessment thus far. The Minister, the recent experience of flooding, particularly in places like Carnlock, Carrick, Fergus and further up the coast, should have demonstrated to us the value of one lead agency. That clearly is the PSNI. Does she agree with me that it would be appropriate that should we have further severe winter conditions, the PSNI should be the lead agency coordinating district councils and others? I think it would be dependent on the circumstances of the incident at the time. Um, in this, because of the flooding, because of the risk to life, it was decided that the PSNI was the natural lead. If that was the case that in the future, if that was what was needed, then I'd be open to um, whatever, whatever, doing whatever was best for the situation at that time. Thank you. And Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister will be aware, maybe last week in the news, we've seen where my constituency colleague highlighted the rural crime problem we have, and it's not something that's new. Could the Minister tell us maybe what she's doing in conjunction with the PSNA and her department to try and tackle this problem that has been going on for some time now? I agree with you, and it is a serious problem. And I've had ongoing engagement with um, DOJ and with the Chief Constable. Um, we actually meet on a regular basis just to discuss issues and emerging trends and themes that, um, that everybody's picking up on. Um, we have a very eff efficient um, enforcement team in place, um, and we also have a representative now on the Rural Steering Group. So that's all the agencies working together around um, the best approach. So I'll continue to carry um, forward my role in terms of. Um, addressing what are the very real concerns of rural dwellers around crime. Um, and you'll be aware in, in particular areas we have issues with cattle theft, in other areas it could be around equipment. So we need to look at everything and make sure that um, all agencies are playing their role. And I'll not be shy in always taking my issues to the PSNA and also the DOJ. I have a clerk for a supplementary. <laughs> yeah. so, sorry about that, I was actually daydreaming there after that. Uh, um, in, in terms of that, I mean, can the Minister maybe outline exactly what her department has been doing to date? Because I'm sure you will accept that uh, I think statistically the, the, the figures are an increase. So whilst they accept what the Minister said that there has been various agency meetings and agencies are working together, but would you accept not enough has been done? Could you give us an insight what you're going to do and what has been happening? Well, I think that it's a positive that we now have a rural crime steering group. So I think that's good that we have all the agencies sitting around the table and working together around how we can combat um, rural crime. I mean, the member is aware that um, responsibility for combating rural crime falls primarily to the Department of Justice and, and to PS, PSNI. But DARD um, have continued to play their role, particularly around um, our CAFRI advisors, you know, giving advice around um, keeping your equipment safe, keeping your, your, uh, all, your owners, all your individual things safe. And we have been working in terms of um, workshops, providing, you know, at the colleges having workshops around rural crime around rural crime awareness. So there's quite a number of things that are being taken forward in conjunction with, um, with the other agencies. And I think, you know, in looking to the future and looking towards um, support for, for example, um, farm modernization program, I think as a criteria, we may want to consider things like you have to have identification tags on your things. So I think there's a number of initiatives that we can take forward that will be hopefully a benefit to, to rural people. Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, ask the Minister would she join with me in recommending to our young farmers that they would follow the example of the future King, Prince William, by enhancing their agricultural qualifications? Well, I think it's encouraged in, itse in itself that our agricultural colleges are oversubscribed, so we already have so we have the young people that are see, see a future in either farming or food. So that's something that's very enc encouraging. We have an opportunity now with CAP reform to actually tailor supports, financial supports for young farmers. So obviously that's um, something that hopefully will create a bit of an incentive to support those young people to stay in the industry. As I said earlier, the age profile of the farming community is, is something that's of concern. We need to sustain that for the future. And the only way we can do that is if we have new people and young people coming into the industry. So whatever I can do to su um, support those young people to to come into the industry to encourage them and we're doing that through as i said through our colleges and hopefully then through cap reform with some financial incentive also mr mcnary for a supplementary i thank the minister for her answer 
Um, and I wonder, um, can I take it in what she's saying, uh, as she's already identified the potential of difficulties with the new cap schemes um, for, in particular, young farmers? Um, is she able to perhaps say or give some kind of direction to these young farmers at, as to what level of qualifications they should be pursuing that will help them in their, in, in their future? Well, I think, as I said, it's part of the consultation process and we can look at all of that um, and I haven't taken final decisions on it. But obviously, in looking towards um, new ways of farming, being innovative, young people um, having the qualifications is obviously something that's significant and will assist them in terms of their own business and how they run their business. So um, we very much encourage people to get on board to attend the courses. Um, and we have formal and sort of less formal um, learning environments for people, so it tries to appeal to everybody. Well, Mr. Michelle, Michael Bean. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what plan she has to convene a meeting with relevant stakeholders to explore options around the restructuring of the fishing fleet, um, in particular around the issue of decommissioning? Uh, I think it was back in November time I met um, with the representatives of the fishing industry and I suggested at that time that I thought it would be important that we could get a stakeholder forum back together again. It's something that happened in the past, so I think there are benefits all around if that was to happen. So I've agreed to meet um, for officials to meet with the industry again this month and then we'll take it forward straight after that. Michael Bean for supplementary. Thank you. And further to that question, can the Minister confirm if monies which had been ring fenced under EFF for decommissioning are still available? I will, um, I will write to the member on that issue, but in terms of moving forward, obviously we have the new EFF and we have the EMFF, so um, there are opportunities there for funding for the industry. But I think if we were to get that stakeholder group again together, let's get a collective voice about what are the needs of the industry and then use the European funding to obviously to, to meet the, the needs that are identified. And uh, Ms. Judith Cochrane is not in a place, so I'll call Mr. Ian McRae. Um, can the, the Minister um, detail how many farms had their remote sensor um, inspection carried out in 2013? I don't have the figures on me, but somewhere around 1,200, but I'll, I'll confirm in writing to, to the member. And there were two areas that were chosen, two geographical areas, one towards the east and one towards the west. So I think it's around about 1,200, but I'm happy to confirm in writing. I'm pray for supplementary. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Minister uh, advise the House why um, these farms or farmers weren't notified that these inspections were taking place? Um, because many of them were expecting money at the end of the year and found that that, that didn't happen. And the Minister will certainly be aware that uh, farmers depend on that money. So, can she detail why they weren't informed that these inspections were taking place? Well, we did actually write to, to people who were being inspected. Obviously, the aim is to get as many inspections done by remote sensing as possible, so we're in a position to get payments out quicker. Um, I suppose that's challenging to start, and it's different for people and uh, all the rest. But by the end of February, we intend to have those people who were um, inspected that way to have their payments with them. So we're working, we're working actively towards that now at this moment in time. Um, but people were written to individually to say that their, their inspection was um, being taken. That way. Well, Mr. Declan, Michael Lear. Um, uh, given that there may well be uh, environmental implications of the DAP inspired court case to quite a transfer of funds from Pillar 1 to the Rural Development Programme, could the Minister tell us what was the response of the Environment Minister when you alert him of your proposal to transfer 7% from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2? Yes. As I said earlier, when I uh, wrote to all ministers, the DOE minister was the only minister that actually responded to the potential um, Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 transfer. Obviously, he's very concerned about the environmental schemes and wants to see them going forward. He's also very alert to the fact that our officials have been working together to try and design the new scheme and have it in place and ready to go as soon as uh, we implement the new cap. So that was his concerns, and he wanted to just make sure that we were protecting the environment. I want to, as I said earlier, assure the member that I am as wedded to ensuring that we bring forward um, environmental schemes, albeit it's going to be more difficult now because we have a lesser pot of money. For a supplementary. Last call, the Minister has already answered my supplementary.
Order. Mr. Fergal McKinney has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the motion. To ask the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety what steps he is taking to address crisis conditions experienced by patients recently at the Accident and Emergency Departments in Craigavon Area Hospital and the Royal Victoria Hospital. And I call the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Last week's circumstances were exceptional. And it's important not to confuse an exceptional circumstance with overall performance in the Royal Victoria and Craigavon Area Hospitals Emergency Departments. The escalation plan at the RVH, which included some ambulances being diverted to the Ulster Hospital, worked effectively, and normal arrangements resumed within a matter of hours. Ambulances were also diverted to other hospitals for a time last week in response to the situation at Craigavon Hospital which was significantly busier than usual. This is a routine part of the operational management of pressures across the system. The Health and Social Care Board and Belfast Trust are reviewing the major incident declared by the Trust to see whether well refinement in the HSC business continuity planning is required to respond more appropriately to future incidents of this kind. It is important to note that there will continue to be periods of pressures in all our emergency departments throughout the winter, and this is to be expected in emergency departments. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, and at the outset, can I thank you and the House for acknowledging the major importance of this issue. The SDLP warned, and not just before Christmas, but many months ago, that the savage budget cuts that the DUP and others back would provoke just such an outcome for vulnerable people. The SDLP also warned that the recent closures announcement in Down and Lagan Valley were wrong and would have a negative impact. They should be reversed. And we, like patients, staff and unions, were shocked uh, to see what happened uh, in the Royal Victoria on Wednesday and the Craig Avon on the previous Monday. For us, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, this is about accountability. How a decision in one area could potentially affect another, and in this case it has affected uh, a number of other areas negatively and to significant uh, uh, degree. Is the tail wagging the dog, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and who is ultimately responsible? Wednesday at the Royal Victoria Hospital was a symptom, not a cause. Uh, Mr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, we need to know the extent to which those earlier decisions impacted on Wednesday night's uh, crisis, and can the Minister tell us uh, what steps have been taken to assess that? Well, there has been a, a course of work done in terms of <coughs> assessing the impact of uh, the closures of Down and, and Lagan Valley at the weekends uh, on the other trusts. And the assessment carried out would indicate that the situation at the Royal Victoria Hospital on the Wednesday night was in no way related to the reduction in the hours at emergency departments at Lagan Valley and Down hospitals, which of course is on uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, what did happen at the Royal uh, was the Royal is a hospital which admits around 70 to 80 people uh, uh, each day. Uh, over the course of, of the days associated um, with, with uh, the, the backlog in the emergency department, they were admitting over 100, 110 in one case. Consequently, there was a degree of backing up and there wasn't enough people being discharged. And as a result of that, they introduced an emergency plan. I just wish that our politicians, and indeed our media, would actually be more mature in how they assess things. Because three hours after an emergency plan was initiated, things were back to normal in the Royal Victoria Hospital. And as we would look at things even as they stand today, as at a quarter past three today, there are 67 people who are waiting in the emergency department in the Royal Victoria. Nobody has been waiting in excess of eight hours. And when I say waiting, people are triaged normally within 15, 20 minutes. In some cases, it can be a bit longer, but they're normally triaged within that time. Whenever we say waiting for four hours or 12 hours, what we're actually referring to is people having been treated and either sent home 
or else having a bed within the hospital. That is the 12-hour waits that we're talking about. We're not talking about people waiting for 12 hours to see a doctor or a nurse. That is not the case. In the Ulster Hospital, um, at a quarter past three today, there's currently 58 people waiting for treatment, Antrim 46, and Craig Avon 73. Over the weekend, nobody had to wait for longer than 12 hours. So we do not have a situation where we have a crisis in emergency departments across Northern Ireland. What we have wit witnessed is on one particular night in the Royal, that a backlog that had come from previous two days, and it was difficult right through from the Monday right through to the Wednesday. We've witnessed that, but it has been dealt with and has been responded to. We have seen that Craig Avon Hospital has had its struggles on a Monday night, and it has used the divert mechanism uh, to go to the Daisy Hill and to the South West Hospital, uh, where uh, it's very appropriate for people from the southern part of the Craig Avon uh, Trust area, or the, the Southern Trust area, uh, to go to the South West Hospital. And that has helped to alleviate those problems. But we should have a greater degree of maturity and actually identify whenever people respond well to deal with a difficult situation, as opposed to homing in on, wow, there was lots of people waiting in an emergency department. That will happen from time to time. We cannot predict whether today there is going to be 300 people come into the Ulster Hospital or indeed the Royal Victoria Hospital to the emergency department or whether it will be 200. What is important is how we respond and the response dealt with the issue and has ensured that normality returned to the hospital. And I call Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister what steps are being taken to ensure that our acute uh, emergency departments such as the Royal and Craig Avon and the Ulster that are those specialist units with all of the support necessary to deal with major trauma are being freed up so that that's what they deal with, emergency serious incidences and where local people need attention that can be, pr be provided for in their local hospitals such as at Lagan Valley and reopening of their emergency department and through greater access to GPs. Um, well, <clears throat> let's be absolutely clear. Uh, first of all, we have our major acute hospitals, which should be dealing um, with the major acute incidences, as well as providing uh, support for people who have other requirements uh, within their catchment area. We also have a range of smaller hospitals, which should be able to provide um, key services. And I am deeply unhappy, uh, and have recorded this, uh, that the Lagan Valley and Down um, are being closed at weekends. However, let's be quite clear about it. And people can talk about savage cuts. The money has always been available to employ doctors to man these facilities. However, the doctors are not available to cover it. So the South Eastern Trust find themselves in a situation where they had 70 shifts not covered. And therefore, that trust took a decision to close both those facilities on the basis that they couldn't provide a safe service. Now, as a minister, can't argue with that. If a trust comes to me and says, we can't provide a safe service, I can't say, you must provide an unsafe service. That would be irresponsible to do that, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. However, I think it is fundamentally important that the South Eastern Trust work to ensure that there is 24-7 front door access to both the Lagan Valley Hospital and the Down Hospital that they continue to seek to recruit people um, for the front door of the hospital. And just remember this, all of the house again, uh, be very clear, if they have difficulty recruiting doctors for emergency departments throughout the rest of the United Kingdom, why would we not have difficulty recruiting them in places like Lagan Valley and Down? It's natural that those places are going to have real difficulty in seeking to recruit uh, people of the standing and standards that we would expect to provide the care uh, for our people here in Northern Ireland. I'd also put uh, a very clear marker down, because the GPs have been uh, very supportive in the Down area, that we need greater support from GPs for the Lagan Valley Hospital, and perhaps uh, we need to look at how we can extend things further in the Down area, because we will not naturally fit in uh, with every other emergency department uh, in the